of the House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing met to continue hearing testimony in their investigation of alleged mismanagement and influence peddling at the Department of Housing and Urban Development. Samuel Pierce, who served as HUD secretary during the Reagan administration, had been scheduled to appear before the panel, but on Thursday canceled his appearance and said he needed more time to prepare for the questioning. Members of the subcommittee went ahead with a brief meeting, and coming up next, we bring you that session, which is chaired by California Democrat Tom Lantos. Subcommittee on, <coughs> subcommittee on Housing and Employment will please come to order. This is the second uh, scheduled appearance of uh, former Secretary of HUD, Sam Pierce, to discuss with the subcommittee the three topics that uh, I agreed to limit this discussion to, his previous testimony, the question of uh, a project in Durham, North Carolina, and the conflicting testimony given under oath by Mr. Pierce and other witnesses in the hopeful attempt to resolve those conflicts. And the third topic is the question of uh, a mortgage firm, DRG, where Mr. Pierce, overruling his professional staff, allowed this company to do continuing business with the result that we now have a bankrupt portfolio of over $500 million. I will now call the witness, Mr. Sam Pierce, to the witness table. <clears throat> Evidently, Mr. Pierce has chosen, in a unilateral and arbitrary fashion, to break a firm agreement I made with him and his attorney to appear voluntarily at this hearing today. I am reminded of a letter found in Mr. Pierce's files from former Interior Secretary James Watt, which begins, and I quote, Dear Sam, you are a man of your word, end quote. Regrettably, that statement appears to apply only to mod rehab units. In order to understand all of the ramifications of this breach of faith, I would like to review the subcommittee's dealings with Mr. Pierce. He's not an easy man to find, but uh, through persistent and imaginative efforts, the subcommittee staff located him in early May and arranged for his voluntary appearance on May 25. After Mr. Pierce's initial testimony before our subcommittee in May, a number of witnesses raised important questions that could only be resolved by Mr. Pierce. Accordingly, on July 8, I asked him to, a to appear again before this subcommittee. He requested as much time as possible to prepare for his second appearance. Therefore, at Mr. Pierce's request, I scheduled him to testify on August 3, the last day before Congress adjourned for its August district work period. Mr. Pierce gratefully accepted that date, and we had a firm agreement that he would testify on August 3. In late July, Mr. Pierce informed the subcommittee of his apparent difficulty in finding a Washington attorney, and he requested an additional delay. Now, I could understand having difficulty finding affordable housing in Washington, 
but not an attorney. <laughs> Nevertheless, I gave him the benefit of doubt, and at his request, I again agreed to delay his appearance before the subcommittee for an additional six weeks. Also, at Mr. Pierce's request, I agreed to limit the matters to be discussed at the hearing to his prior testimony, his role in the Durham Hosiery Mill project, and his actions on a coinsurance lender designated as DRG. During the course of the summer, the staff of the subcommittee assisted Mr. Pierce in obtaining copies of documents from HUD which relate to these topics, and has obtained on his behalf every specific document he requested. On September 6, Mr. Pierce and his attorney came to my office requesting yet another postponement of his appearance for an additional two weeks. I told him and his attorney then that I would not agree to a third delay. As was discussed at my meeting last week with Mr. Pierce and his attorney, a formal written request for a postponement was submitted by them, and I responded, as I indicated I would, with a formal written denial. There was not the slightest indication whatsoever. I wish to repeat this. There was not the slightest indication whatsoever, either by Mr. Pierce or by his attorney, that Mr. Pierce might not appear today. Had there been any such indication, the subcommittee would have issued a subpoena compelling his appearance here today. But the subcommittee acted in good faith and assumed erroneously that Mr. Pierce was also acting in good faith. Yesterday morning, 9.30, was the deadline for the submission of the prepared written testimony of Secretary Pierce. We were told that testimony would come in only in the early afternoon. Nothing came at 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock. And at 4.30, as chairman of the subcommittee, I called Mr. Pierce's attorney. I think it's important to underscore that the telephone call was placed by me. Mr. Pierce's attorney was busy, but he did return my call shortly before 5 o'clock. I was advised at that time by Mr. Pierce's attorney that contrary to his and Mr. Pierce's firm commitment to the subcommittee, Mr. Pierce would not appear as a witness today. After considerable discussion, I told Mr. Pierce's attorney that if his client did not appear as scheduled, the subcommittee would begin immediate subpoena proceedings. I expressed my strongly held view that it is in Mr. Pierce's best interest to appear voluntarily as scheduled. I told Mr. Pierce's attorney that the subcommittee has been more than accommodating to his client, giving him several lengthy postponements and allowing him to testify on only a limited range of topics at uh, today's hearing. I further advise Mr. Pierce's attorney that the subcommittee will meet at 9.30 a.m. as scheduled today, and Mr. Pierce will be called to testify. He will then be given an opportunity to argue for an additional postponement, and should he persuade members of this subcommittee, such postponement would be granted. And should he testify as scheduled, he would be excused from answering specific questions if he claims unavailability of needed documents. I cannot conceive of how this subcommittee could have been more solicitous, gracious, generous in setting the most favorable terms and schedule for Mr. Pierce. 
I consider Mr. Pierce's decision not to appear as scheduled to be capricious, deceitful, and the betrayal of the good faith in which this subcommittee has dealt with him. Despite the very, the very limited scope of today's hearings, Mr. Mr. Pierce's attorney contends that he has not had sufficient time to review all necessary documents. On Monday, Mr. Pierce's attorneys requested certain information from HUD under the Freedom of Information Act, and I would like to read the list of information they felt they needed to prepare for today's hearing. This is a letter from Mr. Pierce's attorney to Mr. James Lafferty, Freedom of Information Officer, Department of Housing and Urban Development, dated September 11, 1989. <clears throat> Dear Mr. Lafferty, in accordance with the Administrative Procedure Act, we are requesting the following materials. One, all documents containing written or printed matter of any kind, including correspondence, telephone logs, appointment books, diaries, memoranda, reports, records, notes, messages, telegrams, telexes, studies, books, pamphlets, minutes, or summaries of meetings or telephone conversations, records, charts, tapes, dictograph, cassette, etc., in the files of the following former or current HUD officials. Samuel Pierce, former secretary of the department, 1981-1989. Deborah Gordine, executive assistant to Secretary Pierce, 1984-1988. Lance Wilson, executive assistant to Secretary Pierce, 1981-1984. Thomas Demery, assistant secretary of housing, 1986 to 1989. J. Michael Keenan, director of housing development, Denver, 1981 to 1984. Linda Murphy, director, HUD Bond Finance Programs, 1981-1982. Janet Hale, General Deputy Assistant Secretary or Assistant Secretary for Housing, 1985-1986. Shirley McVeigh Wiseman, General Deputy Assistant Secretary for Housing or Assistant Secretary, 1983-1985. Silvio De Bartolomez, Acting Assistant Secretary of Housing, or General Deputy Assistant Secretary of Housing, 1983-1986. R. Hunter Cushing, Deputy Assistant Secretary for Multifamily Housing, 1986-1989. Du Bois Gilliam, Bronwyn Morgan, Special Assistant to Secretary Pierce. Joseph Strauss, Special Assistant to Secretary Pierce, 1981 to 1983. Star Eckert, confidential assistant to Secretary Pierce, 1981 to 1989. Philip Wynn, assistant secretary for housing, 1981-1982. Philip Abrams, assistant secretary for housing, 1982-1983. Daniel Hughes, deputy undersecretary, 1982-1983. Gerald Kissner, Deputy General Counsel, 1983-1985. Maurice Barksdale, Assistant Secretary for Housing, 1983-1985. Thomas Casey, Assistant to Janet Hale. This is point one of the request. I now go to point two of the request. All documents relating to the following projects. Durham Hosiery Mill, including the files of John J. Knapp. DRG Funding Corporation, including the files of J. Michael Dorsey. Booker Gardens, Fort Pierce, Florida, Colonial House, Houston, Woodcrest, San Diego, Rivera Beach, Fort Worth. Point three of the request. All correspondence, memoranda, messages, notes, and any other written matter pertaining to former Secretary Samuel Pierce 
and the following persons. Carla Hills, jo Joseph Coors, Charles Markham, Lance Wilson, after his departure from HUD, Linda Murphy, after her departure from HUD, William Taylor, <clears throat> Holland Consulting Group, Carl Peffendorf, Senator Strom Thurmond, former House Representative Jack Kemp, Edward Brooke, Donald Moss de Franco, George de Franco, de Franco Realty, James G. Watt, Paul Manafort, George Haley, Rick Price, R. Carter Sanders, Fuller Brothers Management Company, Zachary Fisher, Larry Fisher, David Carnes after his departure from HUD, Senator John H. Chaffee, Casper Weinberger after his departure from the federal government, Joseph Di Monticello, Lou Kitchen, Daniel Hughes, George Murphy, the Wynn Group. Since these documents, I'm quoting from the letter, since these documents are urgently needed in connection with this firm's representation of former Secretary Samuel Pierce before the House Subcommittee on Employment and Housing, and because he is scheduled to appear before the committee on September 15, 1989, we would appreciate an expedited response to our request. Earlier today, we sent a letter to Frank Keating, HUD's general counsel, explaining our urgent need for certain HUD documents signed by two of Mr. Pierce's attorneys. It is the intent of the chair at the conclusion of this hearing to call Secretary Kemp and to arrange a meeting with him early next week to ascertain from the Secretary the action HUD feels it can take with respect to this request. Uh, it appears to the Chair to be a request of uh, uh, such uh, monumental and mind-boggling proportions that uh, uh, were HUD to be able to provide all this material, it would take a very long time indeed to review this. But uh, under the circumstances, the chair has no option but to call a hearing of uh, this subcommittee, a meeting, for Wednesday morning next, September 20th, 930, to vote on a subpoena to compel Mr. Pierce's appearance before the subcommittee. Congressman Lukens. Thank you, Mr. Lantos. First of all, I want to go on record supporting the chairman and I think the, what will ultimately be the will of the committee in the issuance of subpoena for all further appearances on behalf of Secretary uh, Sam Pierce, former Secretary Sam Pierce. I also assume that the um, letters you've read, including the letter we just received on the 14th of September from the Laxalt, Washington, Perito, and Dubuque uh, law firm will be entered into the record. Yes, they, they will be and without objection, they so are. Thank you, Chairman. Well, September 15th, 1989 is not particularly a high water uh, mark in the day of this committee's work. Not only is silent Sam silent, apparently today he's also invisible. His lawyers may not have had sufficient time to prepare. I can understand a uh, late arriving attorney on the scene of this massive uh, difficulty uh, facing the mountain work of, uh, a mountain of paperwork uh, shying away from immediate uh, responsibility dischargement. On the other hand, Secretary Pierce has had not only eight years of HUD to prepare, he's also had since the initial date of his first appearance before this subcommittee, the full knowledge that this committee intended to pursue vigorously and intensely all allegations of HUD mismanagement during his stewardship there. In taking the oath of office, and in promising to carry out the duties and responsibilities of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, Sam Pierce took upon himself and accepted full responsibility for the management of a very complicated, very large federal agency with a tremendously important job, housing for the lesser fortunate people of our country. 
If other persons, including Deborah Dean, indeed ran HUD programs in an unfair and unethical manner, and possibly illegal, although we certainly do not know that at this stage, it was and is again Mr. Pierce's direct responsibility personally to appear before this Congressional Committee, the American public, and explain his period of stewardship at HUD. If Mr. Pierce did, which is apparently true from the correspondence and the files we have before us, reinstate DRG Funding Corporation after HUD has suspended them from the multifamily co-insurance program for serious breaches of, parent, of acceptable mortgage underwriting practices, then he has an additional responsibility, an absolute responsibility, personal direct responsibility to appear before the country and specifically this subcommittee and explain his reasons for such action. It may be true that Mr. Pierce reduced operating and overhead costs during his stewardship at HUD while increasing the um, actual housing output at that same time. We do not know this unless we have Mr. Pierce's uh, testimony and his assistance in determining the truth and the factual factuality of that charge. We should hear his side, but we cannot hear his side if he's not here. Maybe in his haste to fulfill what he perceived to be his obligations to manage and operate HUD, he simply let good management and very real oversight of the hundreds of programs there and the projects go by the wayside. Mr. Pierce owes this committee and the American taxpayer a full explanation, and he cannot do it without appearing in public to testify and give his side. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Congressman Frank. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first, I want to comment on the way in which you've approached this. Uh, I have uh, become not entirely to my liking, somewhat more familiar with investigative procedures in these last couple of weeks than I would otherwise have chosen. And uh, drawing on that, let me say that my own view is that your approach towards Mr. Pierce has, as you said, been generous and forthcoming. It seems to me that uh, it is very much in the public interest when questions of this sort or of any other sort are raised, it's a principle I try to act on myself, that the public is entitled to the promptest possible resolution of those issues before the appropriate body. And uh, I must say, I think that throughout this period, your dealings with Mr. Pierce and Mr. Weisberg's dealings uh, on your behalf with his attorneys and Mr. Pierce himself have been very fair. We are facing now, I think, not an inability uh, to meet. I, the freedom of information request, we should be very clear, is not only foolish, but uh, I think we probably ought to have some research done to see. I assume that HUD is exempt from the District of Columbia recycling law, because if not, I don't think there was any way they could comply both with the Freedom of Information request and the new DC recycling law. They would have to uh, set up their own separate place uh, to deal with it. The FOIA request does not appear to be a serious one. As to the newness of the attorneys, Mr. Pierce has had significant time to find counsel. Clearly, and I think it's consistent with the way you have run this, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, had Mr. Pierce chosen to attend today with his attorney, if a particular set of questions had come up about which they thought they needed more time, it seems to me very clear to people who've watched this subcommittee that that would have been granted, that none of us would have, would have, uh, I'll yield, Jim. My colleague will yield. That was made clear to both Mr. Pierce and to his attorney. Yeah, and and uh, let me say one reason why I particularly regret this. Uh, we're in what to me seems to be a second phase of this hearing. So, uh, I'm a member of the Housing Subcommittee of the Banking Committee. Other members are not, but I know they have a great interest in this, and we've been benefited from the participation in the hearings earlier of uh, members of the Housing Subcommittee, uh, our colleague Ms. Rakama, the ranking minority member of the subcommittee, uh, our colleagues Mr. Schumer, Mr. Morrison, and others. Now that the Savings and Loan Bill is out of the way, the major job of the Banking Committee for the rest of this year will be to draft a housing bill. We have some serious problems with people facing expulsion from their homes because of prepayment uh, of some of the uh, uh, mortgages. It is going to be the job of the Housing Subcommittee with the cooperation of this subcommittee to write a bill which prevents to the extent that we can some of the abuses that have been uncovered without endangering our ability to provide housing services. 
And one of the things, frankly, I had looked forward to asking Mr. Pierce with his eight years of, of serving, and I intend to ask every witness is, we have uncovered a pattern of some wrongdoing. We'll continue to look at that. But can you also help us? How can we make it better? How can we combine necessary administrative discretion with safeguards against abuse? That's very important. And I very much regret that we are not going to have Mr. Pierce's views. I know he has views on this. Uh, but I, I did want to stress that I, I hope we will now become, and I think every member of this subcommittee not only agrees to this, but has said so at various points. None of what we have uncovered is a reason to get the government out of the business of trying to help provide people shelter. Our job is to take the material that this set of investigations has come up with and see that it's integrated into the work of the housing subcommittee so that we prevent abuse, uh, not that we prevent housing. That's the approach I believe Secretary Kemp wants to take. It's the approach I was hoping we would get from uh, Mr. Pierce. Uh, so let me say I am going to be voting for a subpoena, but I think we should again reiterate, as you do, no one's expecting Mr. Pierce to be able to answer questions that he legitimately can't answer, but the suggestion that he can't come at all seems to me an unfortunate one, and I, I am sorry that it's reached this point. Thank you very much, Congressman Shays. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Sammy Pierce has had a distinguished career, and he was uh, very honestly a very logical appointment to HUD, and as we began to look at HUD, we began to realize that, um, regrettably, he seemed very disinterested in being the cabinet official and, um, and allowed HUD, which was in disarray when he came to, to be even worse when he left. And I, I came this morning with the hope and expectation, very honestly, that he would reconsider and attend these hearings uh, because it was in his best interest, uh, given the limited scope, as has been mentioned, uh, and the ability that he would have been uh, provided to say that he did not have all the information he needed. So obviously, I intend to support uh, any request that you uh, make on this committee uh, to subpoena Samuel Pierce. And um, just say that um, I am convinced that this committee has done a tremendous job uh, during the last uh, 15 hearings that we've had. Uh, we have a long ways to go, and I'm proud to serve with my colleagues here uh, to uh, make a difference at HUD, to eliminate those programs that need to be eliminated, uh, to revise those that uh, need revision, uh, to have new programs where they're needed, to toughen the regulations where the regulations need to be toughened, uh, and to make changes in the personnel at HUD, both politically and uh, even career where they may need to be taken. Um, I'm determined that these hearings are going to amount to something meaningful and beneficial uh, for the people of this country, uh, as is our job. Thank you. Thank you very much, Congressman Weiss. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First, let me commend you once again for the very judicious manner in which you've conducted the set of hearings, and most especially in regard to Mr. Pierce himself. Uh, I find Mr. Pierce's behavior to be bizarre. Uh, his conduct is totally irresponsible, incomprehensible, and I think unacceptable. Uh, I certainly think that uh, you're being more than, than uh, judicious in holding off the issuing of the subpoena until next Wednesday. Uh, I think that uh, Mr. Pierce has worn out whatever courtesies uh, he was previously receiving or, was, or thought that he was entitled to. Uh, it, it really is, is I think, uh, unfortunate to have somebody who for eight years has held cabinet-level position, cabinet position in the United States government, to be engaged in such a patently deceptive course of conduct, and uh, I would think that uh, we really ought to move as quickly as we can to uh, go get on with our business. I thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> the chair um, uh, will ask his colleagues to meet uh, here uh, in the Rayburn Building in a room to be designated on Wednesday at uh, 9.30 a.m. for the purpose of uh, voting a subpoena for Samuel Pierce. This action is taken in sorrow, not in anger, but we have no option but to proceed in teaching Mr. Pierce that while he may run, he may not hide. He had eight years as Secretary of HUD. Serious questions have been raised by 
tremendous range of people running from the current Secretary of Housing, Mr. Kemp, to plethora of individuals across the political spectrum, the housing spectrum about his stewardship. He is responsible to tell this subcommittee and the American people everything we wish to know concerning an eight-year stewardship. Are there any other comments any of my colleagues would care to make? Congressman Lukens. I wish to go on record as saying I not only do I fully support the subpoena meeting next Wednesday, I know the chairman and members of the committee know I was one of the few votes to vote no. The first uh, two occasions I think that the chairman and the committee asked for a subpoena, I reluctantly uh, vote for subpoenas. I don't like them. But in this case, I just want to go on record and say I think this committee really has been understanding and patient. And I don't wish to plagiarize, but to paraphrase my chairman, it is true that uh, Mr. Pierce did not speak today, but it doesn't mean he doesn't have to answer eventually. This uh, hearing is concluded. Thank you. The House Government Operations Subcommittee on Employment and Housing will meet next on Wednesday morning, and C-SPAN cameras will be on hand. Watch C-SPAN schedule updates that day, Wednesday, for the exact air times. Coming up next, refugee admissions into the United States is the topic before a congressional panel.